In today's Poker 101 lesson, we're going to talk about the power position and positional advantage. So if you don't know what those are, stay tuned because you're going to want to watch this video. Hey guys, welcome to today's video. I'm Alton Harden, founder of Microgrinder Poker School, and if you don't know what we're all about, Microgrinder Poker School and our YouTube channel is all about turning beginning and struggling poker players into solid winning poker players through strong poker fundamentals. So if you guys are new to this channel, please consider subscribing, and without further ado, let's go ahead and let's get into today's lecture. Welcome to today's lecture for our Poker 101 course. So for today's lecture, we're going to talk about a vitally important concept, and it's a concept that a lot of my students come in not knowing about or struggling with, and when they hear about this concept and they start to utilize this concept, it entirely transforms their game. And so we're going to talk about the power position and positional advantage. And this is so powerful, it's so important that you're going to hear a lot of poker coaches and a lot of poker professionals say that position is power. And it's probably one of the most important things in poker because it probably is. So in today's video, we're going to talk about how you can utilize the power position and positional advantage, your positional advantage on your opponents to number one, value bet better, number two, bluff better, and number three, play better poker because it's so much easier to play a hand in position than it is out of position. Let's face it, playing a hand out of position downright sucks compared to when you're in position. So the easiest way to do this is to jump on over to my poker table, and then we're just going to walk through some demonstrations on there. I'm going to show you how we can utilize the power position and why it's so important and how it plays a big role both in pre-flop play and post-flop play, as well as when you have a made value hand and when you want to bluff. So let's go ahead and let's get into it. The easiest way to talk about the power position and positional advantage is just to do a demonstration. So that's why I set my poker table up to do that. So what I did is I set up a standard, what we call six max table. There's six players. So we have small blind here. We have big blind here. We have under the gun, or we call that early position. We have middle position here. We have the cutoff and then myself on the dealer button. So when we talk about positional advantage and the power position, it plays a role both in pre-flop play and post-flop play. And I want to start off talking about pre-flop. I did put some cards out here for the flop, but we can ignore those. I just wanted to put, put them out here so I have specific cards here so we can talk about them with some examples. Um, when we talk about pre-flop play, positional advantage plays a role in terms of the hands that you can open raise with and that you can call with. So when we look at this, the blinds have already put their force bets out, their blinds out. Under the gun is first act, and under the gun is what we call, is there an early position? So they are out of position to middle position, cutoff, and the button post-flop. And, and in fact, pre-flop, they're still out of position to the small blind and the big blind because they still get to act after under the gun. So this is important to understand because it plays a role in regards to what type of ranges this opponent can open raise. So if we think about it, the more players that there are left to act, the higher the probability that somebody left to act could wake up with a strong hand. And so that plays a factor in the type of hands that this person can open raise. It also plays a factor in the type of hands that these opponents can call an open raise with. And so we're not going to get into all the nuances of this and the ranges that you can open and the ranges you shouldn't open and all that stuff. That's going to be in Poker 201 when we talk about preflop play. But I want you to understand that this is why, in general, people open a tighter, stronger range under the gun than they do in middle position, than they do in the cutoff, and than they do on the button. Because by the time we get to the button, we have positional advantage post-flop and there's only the blinds left to act after us. So that's why the button is by far, the dealer button position, is by far the most profitable position in Texas Hold'em. Because if it folds around to us, there's already dead money in the pot that the blinds have posted, and we have position on both of them post-flop. So that's the basic premise behind that. Now let's talk about how the power position dictates things with post-flop play. So let's assume, I'm just going to assume that we are playing six ways 
And let's assume that this player folds. Let's assume that this player folds. And let's put the cards over here. And let's assume that the small blind calls and the big blind calls as well. And so we end up going to the flop four different ways. So I'm going to say that it's just limp pot. I mean, we could say that it's raised, but for this just simple example, for the first one, we'll say that it's a limp pot. Now, in terms of the actual cards, we're not going to worry about what they are. We're just going to work through an example. We're just going to put an example flop up here. So I am going to save this one for later for a specific heads up example. But for this one, let's just pick three random cards for the flop. So when we're looking at this, if one of these opponents end up flopping something like middle pair or straight draw, it's a lot harder for them to play out of position because they could decide to take a check call line. They could decide to lead out. But the problem is, is that they don't know how. Let's assume it's a small blind. The small blind doesn't know how the big blind cut off or the button are going to react. Is the big blind cutting or button going to fold? Or are they going to raise? They don't know. So that's the issue with being first to act and being out of position. And let's assume that this opponent, maybe they have an eight or nine. Maybe it's a club or a spade. So they don't have any sort of a backdoor draw or a draw to a flush. Just a straight, just a gutter straight draw. Being in position, if we switch things around, if we now assumed that Let's say I'm this person and now I'm on the button and I have the draw. Let's assume that it checked around to me. I have a lot of information. I know that these players, when they check this flop, they probably don't have that strong of a hand. So I can get away with semi buffing a lot more frequently than the small blind can because if the small blind leads out, they don't know how this person is going to react or this person or myself. But if it's me, if it's checked around to me, I already know that they don't really like this flop too much. They don't have that strong of a hand. And, and if they have some sort of a draw, they're playing it passively. And if they have a made hand, well, maybe they are trying to induce me to bet. But in general, and let's just, let's just take these back. We just really don't need the chips out there. Um, in general, let's assume that it checks around to me on the button or even in the cutoff. The cutoff gets to see what they both do. I get to see what all three of the people do on the button, on the flop. And so if it checks around to me, I can just bet and hope that they fold. And I'm assuming because they check the flop, they have weaker capped ranges. And so we're going to get away with bluffing a lot more often. So that's an example of being in position versus out of position and really how that dictates things and how it makes it harder for number one, when you're out of position to get away with bluffs and semi-bluffs because you don't know how your opponents are going to react. And let's assume that, let's find a card. Let me find a card that's not going to really change much on this board texture. And of course, everything that I'm finding so far is going to change things. So I'm looking for just a random card that's not really going to change much. And everything I have so far is... So let's put a... There we go. Let's put a deuce of spades on the turn. So let's assume with a deuce of spades comes on the turn. Let's assume this first example, this opponent let out and big blind folded and cut off folded and I called. The deuce really doesn't change much. So the question is, what does a small blind do now? Do they continue to double barrel with a semi bluff or do they not? It puts them in a bit of a predicament. But if we switch these things around, if I'm the person that that bet on the flop and only the small blind called and the deuce came on the turn, if he checks, I can bet again and I'm in position. And again, he's showing weakness. Now, he may be doing a procedural check, but still, the deuce doesn't really change much. And so if he has a draw, it doesn't improve. And, and this also plays a role with value betting as well. So let's assume that we're in a heads-up pot, and he has a pair of tens. He value bets. He's out of position. And on the turn, let's put an ace on the turn, which is... Potentially could be a scare card. It may not be a scare card. What does he do now? He can't really value bet now. 
And it allows me the ability to potentially bluff as well, if, even if I don't have an ace. So it's always hard to extract value, especially thin value, when you're out of position. And the same thing, if we flip this around, let's assume that he has an ace, and he value bets, and I call, and the turn comes, where is that deuce? Let's put a four on the turn, let's put a four there. I think that's fine. Um, question is, does he value bet again when a straight comes? So the four connects with some of the straight draws, but not all of them. So it's, it's very difficult for him. And the question is too, is he needs to ask himself, well, can I get multiple streets of value being out of position? It's gonna be a lot harder, but if he's in position, it's easier to extract value, especially on the river. Um, especially if he has not even an ace, if he has a draw and the draw hits on the river. And so let's put this card on the river. So the fourth straight comes, let's say that he checks, I've been betting all the way, and he ends up getting his straight on the river. And he decides to slow play and check, and then I have the option, I can just simply check back. So let's say I check back. Well, he doesn't get any value that way. So in general, being out of position, it's just a lot harder to play your hands. It's, I mean, that's just what it comes down to. Whether you are value betting, you're bluffing, or semi-bluffing, because you don't get to to see or know what the person that's left to act, whether it be one person, two person, three person, you don't know what they're going to do. And if you don't know what you're, they're going to do, then you have a lot less complete, incomplete information than the people in position because they get to see what everybody else does. And if this is a multi-way hand, if he raises, several people call, if I have a draw, I get to see what they do, I get better pot odds, I potentially get better implied odds. I mean, all that comes into play. Now, if you don't know what pot odds are or implied odds are, don't worry about that too much because we're going to talk about that in the upcoming courses. But I, you know, I do need to kind of talk about it because it plays a role in this. So let's do one more example. Let's get rid of these. And we're going to do a heads up example. So let me get all this out of the way. I want to slide all this stuff out of the way. And let's move that over there. Let's assume that it's me and one other opponent, and let me find one of the cards that I want for this opponent. There we go. So let's assume this is a flop. And let's assume that this person is, and let's just move the dealer button. We don't need it. Let's assume one person's in position, one person's out of position. So let's assume that in the example that I raise preflop with pocket queens. And we're heads up. Let's assume that... In the first example that this person's a little blind, on the big blind, it's blind versus blind. And let's kind of slide things over a little bit so it's probably easier to see. So he's a little blind, on the big blind, the flop comes ace, king, deuce of diamonds. So let's put some money in the middle, just assume that we had some money in the middle pre-flop. And we go to the flop, he checks, with pocket queens, I typically want to check back on this board, so I decide to check. We go to the turn. Let's put the three of spades on the turn. He checks again. I bet. And if he doesn't have an ace, if he doesn't have a king, he's going to fold. Now, the great thing about me checking back the flop and then allowing him to potentially check back the turn, if he checks back the turn, then I know he doesn't have an ace because we expect him to bet an ace a lot unless he has a weaker ace. So he's gonna fold a lot of aces. We also get him to fold some kings on the turn because sometimes he's just trying to get a showdown with the king. So even though I just have queens here in position, it allows me to turn my queens into a bluff here on the turn if he checks back on the turn. And that's the power of being in position. And so we can now switch things around. Let's now switch it around Let's say he has the pocket queens, and let's get rid of this. And let's just leave that how it is right there. So let's say he has the pocket queens, and he open raises preflop. I call in the big blind with 9-10 of diamonds. Very interesting here. And the flop comes ace, king, deuce, which is terrible flop for queens. So he decides to check, and... I can semi-bluff. So I have an equity for a backdoor straight draw, I have equity for the flush, and I can also represent an ace or king. 
Because if he has an ace, we expect him to bet this flop with his hand. If he has a king, he's going to check back some. So we get him to fold kings. We get him to fold all the pairs that we lose to. We get him to fold all the overcards that we lose to. And so let's say, for example, you know, there's this much money in the pot already. And we bet around two-thirds pot size bet. Maybe he calls once. Maybe he folds. It depends on the opponent. And even if he does call, let's say that he calls. And we go to the turn. It's a blank. He checks again. We go all in or we bet again. And then he folds and we take it down with the worst hand. And so that this is really a great example to show you the power position when it allows you to get away with semi-bluffs or not. It allows you to go for thin value or not. Being in position, it's so much easier. When we had the queens in position and we had the flush draw in position, both of these hands in position, it's just so much easier to play than when we're out of position in the small blind. So that really does highlight the value of position and positional advantage and why position is power. And so you need to understand that being in position allows you to get away with a lot of this stuff. It allows you to semi-bluff. It allows you to bluff. It allows you to float. It allows you to value bet easier, especially when you're thin value betting. All that is so much easier. When you're out of position, all that is so much more difficult because of the incomplete information. Um, now, this was by no means a completely comprehensive discussion on position. There's going to be a lot more complex examples that, that I could potentially do and that you're going to see people do and that's going to come up in games. But I just wanted to highlight that in this lecture and I wanted to talk to you guys about this. So hopefully this kind of gets you, you know, your, your poker brain churning up in here. And if you didn't think about or if you didn't know about positional advantage in the power position, when you go and sit down at a poker table, your next poker game, you start to think about it and you look at poker in, I guess, a, a different lens and a different view to start thinking about it from this perspective. So anyways, let's go ahead and jump back up to uh, my computer and um, we'll go ahead and conclude today's lecture. Well, guys, that's going to conclude today's discussion on positional advantage and the power position. But I'm not done yet. Be sure to check the description area down below because I put a couple of links down there to some strategy articles on the power position and positional awareness. And I want you to watch those because I guarantee you're going to get additional added value from those. And it's really going to enhance your understanding of the power position. A few other things. As usual, give me a thumbs up if you liked the video, and if you're not subscribed to the Microgrinder YouTube channel, please subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your family members, tell all the poker players that you know that might be interested in my channel. Tell them to check it out and tell them to subscribe. And also, if you guys are interested in expanding your knowledge of poker beyond these free courses, there's a coupon code down below, and you can click on that and you can get a discount on our full-fledged courses on Microgrinder Poker School, some of them up to 15 hours in length. And lastly, if you guys love what I do on YouTube, if you love these free strategy articles, if you love this free training, and if you want me to continue to do it on a regular basis and you want to keep it going, you guys can help me out by supporting me on Patreon. I put a link down below, and you can support this channel for as little as $1 per month. So remember, it takes time, effort, money for me to do this, and it takes time away from me doing other things. So if you guys like this stuff, you know, you guys can show your appreciation. You can help support me in this channel by checking it out down below. And I appreciate any support that I get. So anyways, guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. I hope you guys have a great day, and I'll see you guys at our next lecture for the Poker 101 course. Take care.